Michael Zwiefel here from Building Better Athletes, and today's presentation is on getting your Z's and the importance of sleep. Uh, one thing that we tell our athletes um, all the time is sleep is probably the most important thing that you can do for your performance, for your health, for anything really in, in life. Um, uh, sleep kind of is the umbrella that encompasses every aspect of performance. We think about training, we think about practice, we think about games, we think about flexibility, we think about nutrition. Uh, all of those things are basically encompassed underneath sleep. So sleep affects and maximizes all of those things. So we think about, so think about flexibility for a second here. Getting adequate sleep enhances your flexibility. It enhances quality of muscle tone, enhances um, muscle tendon length, and enhances joint mobility. Vice versa, flexibility will not enhance sleep. So sleep kind of has an interplay with all those components of, uh, of performance. And so making sure that we get adequate, adequate sleep will affect and benefit all areas of our, our athletic performance. So we know that sleep is important, but uh, we don't really understand why exactly um, in terms of the physiology, the hormonal profiling, um, the uh, kind of the science behind why sleep is so important. But a lack of sleep that we know does a certain, certain different things for the body. One, it reduces testosterone, which reduces the ability to cover. Okay? It increases cortisol and stress. Uh, increases risk of obesity and risk of diabetes. So sleep deprivation, whether it be chronic, so long-term, or even just <clears throat> losing an hour and a half on a single night or getting a, a night of poor sleep can affect all these um, areas of our performance and our health. It can also impair our appetite regulation, cognitive function, and a mood, which all lead to weight gain and lead to um, poor um, body composition or leads to poor recovery from a training session or practice or a game. And or, and or, uh, leads to just poor performance and function, whether it be on the athletic field, whether it be in the classroom, or whether it be at work. So here are the facts. <clears throat> Stanford University actually did a study with their men's basketball team, and what they did was they had um, half the team get 10 hours of sleep a night. And this over a period of time, what they found was that um, prior, from prior to post, from pre to post, that those athletes that got 10 hours of sleep a night increased their free throw percentage by 9%. They increased their three-point percentage by 9.2%. Uh, they decreased or ran faster in sprint times at over 90 yards by almost a, a, a full second. And they uh, reported increased alertness and mood in terms of their behavior, their attitude, and how they felt um, after these hours of sleep. Now, from a basketball coach perspective or an athlete perspective, 9% free throw and three-point percentage that's a, that's a ton of points, whether it be for an individual or for a team. And that could be mean the difference between uh, a, a number of wins and losses over the course of a season. So just by getting sleep, athletes improve their performance and improve their statistical um, output um, over just, say, a normal thing. What would most athletes would consider would say, let's spend more time in the, in the gym after practice shooting free throws or getting extra shots up. Well, you can improve your percentage and your ability – uh, to repeat a quality performance just by getting adequate sleep at night. And so it's a, it's a modality that a lot of times falls to the background, but if we bring it to the forefront, you'll realize that performance can just be enhanced by getting to bed earlier, sleeping better, and having better quality and quantity of your sleep. Other areas that um, sleep improves or enhances Anything with kind of hitting accuracy. So whether this be tennis, whether it be volleyball, whether it be baseball, accuracy um, of our of our actions is improved by sleep. Um, think about the forty yard dash in the NFL Combine. <clears throat> a tenth of a second decrease can mean the difference between a second round pick and a first round pick. It can literally mean the difference between millions of dollars. And this can be enhanced again just by getting quality and uh, quality of our sleep. Um, so we think about techniques or drills or getting stronger, or working on mechanics. All those things can kind of be obviously to the forefront, but if we just improve our sleep, it improves our body uh, ability to learn those motor patterns and also recover and maximize um, those, those adaptations from our training sessions. Uh, 20, 20 to 30 minute power nap increases alertness by 100%. And we'll go kind of into the details of napping here in a little bit. But lack of sleep, on the other hand, actually increases the reaction time. So it makes us slower to react to a stimulus or to uh, something going on in our game. Um, it, it increases 
4.3% of our split second decision making. So same thing with that reaction time. And it actually makes us weaker. Um, just after four nights of losing sleep, we can lose strength by up to 20 pounds and say a bench press or other forms of, of strength measuring. Along with those lines of, of reducing performance, it also uh, makes athletes a little bit more susceptible to injury. This study shown here, you kind of see in this graph, athletes who slept on average less than eight hours per night had a 1.7 times greater risk of being injured than those who slept nine hours per, or greater than eight hours per night. And if you can see through the, the chart here, each hour that you kind of lost of sleep, it kind of uh, expediated or increased the risk of being injured. So nine hours was less likely to be injured than eight hours. Eight hours less likely to be injured than seven hours. Seven hours less likely to be injured than six hours. So basically every hour of sleep that athletes increased, they decreased their risk of being injured. And so that doesn't stop at just six hours or seven hours or eight hours or nine hours. It kind of keeps going through that, that trend. Um, so just getting an hour more of sleep or even two hours, which would be ideal for most athletic uh, situations, uh, decreases our likelihood of getting injured because we are uh, more robust. We are more recovered. Um, we are more re-energized. We are uh, more attentive, more reactive, which leads us to being in less uh, susceptible in positions or situations to be injured. So sleep can lead to all of these things, increase performance, but also reduce chance of injury, which no coach, no athlete wants. Here's kind of a little uh, summary on sleep deprivation and what it actually does in our body. So it decreases muscle glycogen resynthesis. It increases our sensibility to illness and infection. Okay? It alters our memory and motor learning and it decreases our protein synthesis. So all of these things uh, decrease recovery, decrease performance, uh, decrease our bodies to react, uh, decrease our, our body to more to learn and more performance, and it inc increases our risk of injury and illness. And so all these areas are affected or worsened by sleep deprivation. And you could actually say that most athletes today are probably in a state of some sort of chronic sleep deprivation. Um, we, we've evaluated our athletes, our coll collegiate athletes, and we've shown that the average sleep of over uh, 47 collegiate athletes was an, on average 6.25 hours a night. 6.25 hours a night. Again, very, very low for the given population and the, the demands that they have from athletics and academics um, that we felt that is just a very, very poor. And this shows that the athletes that we work with today's society are kind of in a chronic state of, state of sleep deprivation. So we're going to go real quick on kind of the five sleep cycles, and we'll go into this. Um, the reason we're going this is we'll show you why um, we kind of dictate or schedule our naps or sleep, sleep uh, lengths to uh, kind of cater around these stages. So there's uh, two initial stages. They're classified as light sleep, and they last typically from zero to about 20, 25 minutes. And this is when our body just starts to drop our heart rate, drop our body temperature, and we're kind of in a light sleep zone. Um, we are easily awakened from the sleep zone. We are not entering to our deeper stages of sleep. Um, and this is kind of the stage that we want to target our nap periods. As we get beyond that and more into our, our stage three, four, um, this is where we enter what's called deep sleep. And this is where the body starts to repair and regrow um, different tissues of the body, whether it be bone, whether it be muscle, whether it be tendon, um, the immune system, all of these uh, systems are being repaired and uh, regrown during this time period. And again, this, this deep sleep stage will typically last another 30 to 50 minutes after that light sleep stage. Finally, which ends up and kind of uh, completes a full cycle is what's called the REM cycle or rapid eye movement. And then again, this begins after those, those stages three and four of deep sleep, typically about 70 to about 90 minutes after you fall asleep. This is also classified as kind of your dream stage, or your dream zone. This is where your body goes into uh, producing these dreams that we kind of remember or we think about when we think about sleep. So a full cycle uh, within a given night is kind of repeated about, you know, depending on how long you sleep, three to five times. Like we said at the beginning, sleep is training. Right? Sleep might be the single most important aspect of overall performance. Uh, we think about training for athletes, and we think about in the weight room, we think about practice, we think about games, we think about technical application working with our skill coach. But what is often neglected or kind of put on the back burner is 
sleep's impact on all of those things. And sleep might be the, the best strategy and the quickest strategy to improve performance. We tell our athletes all the time, poor sleep equals poor performance. There's no way around that. Eventually, sleep, if you're not getting enough of it, will catch up to you. While some of our young athletes may be able to get away with some lack of sleep because they're just young um, and they can kind of make up with kind of their, their, their young, robust state, they can make up for getting a lack of sleep, eventually it will catch up to you. And typically, a lack of sleep or chronic sleep deprivation catches up to us at the worst possible times. So what I mean by this is that early in the season or mid-season, you may be able to get away with getting six hours sleep a night here, six hours sleep a night there, five hours, seven hours, uh, but eventually those will catch up to you. And typically when it catches up to you, it's kind of that playoff or tournament or championship uh, time frame during the season. So if you're going three or four months, with lack of sleep, lack of sleep, it's going to eventually rear its ugly head. And typically it rears its ugly head late in the season. This is why you see some drop performance later in the year. Um, a lot of it is, is due to athletes' lack of sleep um, and lack of recovery because they are not getting their eight to nine to 10 hours of sleep at night. Um, you can see the quote there at the bottom. This is from Roger Federer, one of the all-time great tennis players um, in the history of tennis. And you know, he said that you know, if he doesn't get 11 to 12 hours of sleep at night, he just doesn't feel right. He just doesn't feel right. And this next graphic here shows all um, of the <clears throat> number of professional athletes and what they get for sleep uh, in a, on a given night. This white dotted line going across the middle is what the average American gets in sleep, about a little under seven hours of sleep. As you can see, every single athlete, every single professional athlete is well above that line, minus one. And the one minus the, uh, the average American sleep is, is Tiger Woods. And I think you'd be wrong if not showing the correlation that the amount of troubles that Tiger Woods has had recently in terms of injury, in terms of re reduced performance, um, all kinds of kind of nagging uh, pains and aches that have caught up to him. When he was younger, he have, might have been able to get away with those things because of, of, of the state that he's in. But now you can see as he's gotten older, those things are starting to catch up with him, and his health is really going uh, down the tube. But as you can see, most other athletes are well above that line, getting mostly between 8 to 10 hours of sleep uh, on a given night. So recommendations. A uh, key recommendation is, is to get 56 hours per week, which again averaged out to eight hours a night. Um, so an easy reminder is just eight hours a night. Now, the reason that the recommendation is 56 hours a week is because there is you can do some sleep debt or some sleep makeup in terms of you get seven hours for two nights in a row or six hours for a night. You can make up for that and catch up some slack by getting, say, a nine-hour or a 10-hour night um, on, say, a weekend or another night that just kind of makes up for those loss of hours. Now, Given that you can do that, it's not recommended. The body works best when it gets into a, a routine or a cycle where it, can, it has a constant um, bedtime and wake time that the body gets used to. So it's not ideal to go 6, 6, 6, and then 10, 10, 10, something like that where you have a, 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 period of, a period of a few days where you're getting lack of sleep, and then a period of a few days where you're catching up for that sleep. That is not a good cycle to get into. Because eventually, your body will break and those long cycles will not be able to sustain because your body is so used to these, these certain other days where you're not getting the sleep. So it gets used to those bedtimes. It gets used to those wake times. So we want to uh, set a consistent schedule of sleep time and wake up time to give our body the best possible environment to sleep and give us the best possibly quality of sleep. Now, just as there's different times of this year or season that – we kind of periodize our, our training or our practices. Just that there's more times when we're heavier in terms of our training, practice, game schedules. We want to basically relate those heavy times and correspond them with heavy times of sleeping. So if we increased our intensity, our volume of training or practice or games, we want to see that same increase in our sleep to basically counterbalance or counteract um, those heavier more intense times. So whether it be during camp or during the early part of preseason of the season, whether it be you have four games a week, we want to see those periods of time um, counterbalance with a period of time where we're getting trying to get more and more sleep, possibly 10 hours a night or 10 hours within a given day. Finally, we want to, we want to nap whenever possible. So we'll go into here in a second here why naps are important, how long and how we should nap. 
So typically what I recommend is a 20 to 30, 30 minute power nap. Um, and if we can get this for an athlete every single day, that's what we want. I really feel that athletes can find 20 to 30 minutes within every day that they can find time to hit this light power nap. This short period of time, uh, like we talked about, puts us in that, those light sleep stages, and that way we can awake easy, and it leaves us with a quick burst or boost of energy and focus that will kind of carry us on through the rest of the day. If we start going longer than those 20 to 30 minute time frames, uh, specifically to those 40 to say 60 minute time range, this is where we start to enter those earlier stages of deep sleep. And when we awake from these stages, we can actually feel more tired than when we went in. I'm sure we've all felt that before. We have slept for say 45 minutes or 55 minutes and you woke up and you felt more groggy and tired than you did before the nap. And this is because we're starting to enter those initial stages of deep sleep, but we have not completed a full cycle. And so we wake up basically in the middle of our sleep cycle and it's just not a good situation or a good time for us to be awakened. If we can find time, whether it be on a weekend or you have a, a, a big gap between classes, if you can find 90 minutes, then that's great. We can get a full sleep cycle. So that way you get, you're not uh, breaking up the sleep cycle in half where you're not awakening or disrupting that full sleep cycle. So we want to either be in the light sleep stages, so 20 to 25, maybe 30 minutes, or the full cycle, 90 minutes, so we can complete a full sleep cycle and get us through all those stages of sleep that give us the most benefit. And here's just a little um, summary of how long a nap. Again, 20 minutes is where you kind of get that energy boost. Um, you can kind of wake up alert. Anything from that 30 to hour range is where you can you can get some positive adaptations, but usually you're going to wake up groggy and more tired. So if you can get that full sleep cycle, though, an hour and a half, you get um, uh, more creativity is improved, you get more alertness, and you get basically a good a sleep uh, quality rather than trying to wake yourself through in that 35 to hour time range. So some tips to be on uh, improving your sleep. One, like we talked about, is be consistent. Develop a, a routine. Have set bedtimes and set wake-up times. So your body gets into a rhythm or a routine um, on when it should fall asleep and when it should wake up. This is called a circadian rhythm, and the more we can cement these circadian rhythms, the more uh, the more qu the better quality of sleep that we'll get. Second, will be to improve your bedroom environment. So we want to keep our bedroom environment black, as pitch black as possible. We want to keep it cool, and we want to keep our bed just for sleep. So how do you develop a routine? Um, one, we have to have some different strategies. So for my for instance, my personal strategy strategy is I read for 20 minutes before bed, and then I write down kind of a to-do list or thoughts that I will do tomorrow. This way I kind of clear my mind of any kind of um, thoughts or anxiety, and I put them on paper. Then I also kind of read what against my body kind of in a teaches my body how to wind down, teaches my body a routine that when I when it knows that I'm starting to read, it gets into a rhythm and starts to build my circadian rhythms and my melatonin production increases. So it knows it's time to sleep. So those are things um, to do prior to bed. So whether you want to read or stretch or foam roll or do breathing drills or write or meditate or take a hot shower, hot bath, those things all start to prepare our body and prepare our mind into a rhythm to go to sleep, which allows us to fall asleep quicker, allows us to re reach deep sleep faster, and it gives us better quality of sleep. So when we wake up, we have more quality of, quality of sleep. So what you want to avoid before bed, avoid electronics. Again, electronics emit what's called blue light when this disrupts melatonin. We get melatonin is a, a sleep hormone that um, is responsible for basically keeping rhythmic and circadian rhythms. So if we are emitted to blue light, whether it be from your TV, your computer, or your iPhone, or whatever it may be, those send blue light signals to your eyes and then conversely to your brain, and it stimulates basically the brain to be active. It stimulates daylight, and those things disrupt our melatonin production and can they alter our sleep patterns and make us give us a poorer quality of our sleep. We want to try to avoid big meals within an hour and a half before bed. Uh, obviously, we want to avoid alcohol, and obviously, we want to avoid caffeine as early as 4 p.m. If we if we consume caffeine after 4 p.m., again, caffeine is a stimulant. Okay, that stimulant can stay in our body and, and again reduce our body body to get into a deep sleep and REM cycle because our body is uh, actively stimulated rather than being in a state of 
of calmness and rest and digest. Sleep positions, again, when we talk about sleep, oftentimes we don't target how should we sleep. How should our bed uh, be oriented so when we sleep? Uh, typically, there's three back positions, or th excuse me, three sleeping positions. Each one has some different variations to it, but we'll just go over these three basic ones. Um, the best way you can sleep is on your back. Um, it's the best for your spine and your neck. Um, and we always recommend to put a pillow underneath your knees so we keep our our, tr our, our, our pelvis and our lower, our lower back, our lumbar spine in a neutral, um, safe position. If we don't, we can tend to be in a kind of over arch or overextended position, um, which puts a little bit of stress on our lumbar spine. The next best position would be on your side. Uh, again, we usually have to recommend laying your right side. Laying your left side usually puts a little more compression on your heart, reduces our, abilities, our heart's ability to basically pump blood to our peripherals. So try to sleep on your right side. We always again recommend putting a pillow between your knees, which again will keep our pelvis and our lumbar spine in a neutral, more safe position. Um, while sleeping on your side, we want to avoid what's called kind of the fetal position, where your knees are kind of flexed towards your chest. We want to avoid this position because it puts excess uh, flexion forces on our lumbar spine. We know um, flexion forces, whether it be under load or under long duration, is what tends to relate or cause uh, lumbar spine injuries. So it puts a lot of stress on our joint, our lumbar facets, our discs, and puts us in a poor position um, and tend to wake up with some light lower back um, pain. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. And the worst position we can really sleep on is our, is our stomach. It puts our spine and our neck in awkward positions. It puts a lot of pressure kind of on our internal organs because we're laying directly on them. Um, if this is a position, the only position you can sleep, we recommend putting a pillow underneath kind of your, your hips um, or your, your stomach to allow um, our, our pelvis and lumbar spine, again, to be in a neutral position, but also take some of that stress and compression off those internal organs. If you are a stomach sleeper, again, we would like to recommend to try to alter or change to one of the, the side or back positions just to give us a better quality of sleep and put our, our body's position, our joints in a in a safer position so we don't wake up with maybe some joint pain through our back, through our shoulders, through our hips, or something like that. If you're still having trouble sleeping, <clears throat> uh, a lot of people do. There's three things. There's a couple of things that we, we found to really help um, athletes and just people in general to help sleep. One we've talked about is melatonin. You can actually take a melatonin uh, capsule, uh, tablet or, or gummy, or whatever it may be, to kind of aid in sleep, right? Melatonin, again, is responsible for our circadian rhythms, and it basically signals to our body that it's time to rest and time to sleep. So actually taking melatonin can be a good way um, to get to sleep, especially if you're, say, you have um, different hours or you're up late one night or you have to get back into a rhythm of sleep. Um, melatonin is a great option there. Lemon balm um, is basically a, a herb that helps reduce anxiety and kind of um, brings back down our overactive mind and kind of eases us uh, back into sleep. So it kind of is a uh, calming and easing uh, herb that we can use to help benefit an overactive mind before sleep. Another one would be lavender, whether you want to have like an oil to rub on your skin or just kind of some kind of um, odor or scent in the air. Uh, lavender has been shown to reduce anxiety and again, reduce an overactive mind, um, reduce insomnia, those type of things to allow us to sleep better. So if you uh, kind of um, are affected by insomnia or just lack of sleep and overactive mind or, or you know, busy legs in the sleep during, your, during bedtime or sleep, these are three things that might be able to help you in that. Another thing we could always recommend is kind of using a fan. Not only does a fan keep the room cool, and typically we want to keep our room temperature between like 62 and 66 degrees, and a fan allows us to keep the room cool, but it also adds some of a, kind of a white noise. And we tend to sleep better with kind of a rhythmic, a static white noise going on throughout the night. So whether it be a fan or some of those machines that uh, emit sounds like waves crashing against the beach or crickets at night or waves crashing or anything else like that, um, a white noise tends to help us sleep uh, more sound and have higher quality throughout the night. If you live in a dormitory or you have a, a partner or a spouse that snores or you have some noises going on in your house, earplugs are also great. And so if you're a light sleeper and you get awakened easily, throw in some earplugs and block out all that noise, allow you to sleep better. 
And finally, we could recommend is keep a pen and pad bedside. So anytime you have, say, you have an idea or there's thoughts running on your head and you're just like, I got to think about this, I got to think about that, write it down on a pen and paper. That way you can kind of free it and get rid of it from your mind. That way you can kind of ease into your sleep. So keep a pen and pad bedside. That way you can write down anything you have to do the next day or thoughts or ideas that you have so your mind is not continually racing throughout the night. Um, I want to give credit to YLM Sports Science for a lot of the graphs and uh, infographs you saw today. They were responsible for, for taking a lot of the literature and research and throwing together in some of these graphs. So that's great, and uh, thank you to them. Otherwise, thank you. Uh, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram for more tips, more videos, more thoughts on um, how we can improve athletic performance. So thank you.